algebra is okay as long as sine of phi is what? Non-zero? Could sine of phi be zero? When phi is zero and when it's pi. So that's kind of a, that's a little worrying. So let's just for the sake of discussion say, suppose phi is not equal to zero or pi. So then you say theta is what? Inverse tangent? Y over X, and that, that'll be okay except when it's not, right? Because you really have to add some function over here, epsilon, where epsilon, how's epsilon shows? Epsilon is what? Epsilon is equal to zero. X greater than zero, right? I mean, it depends on how we want to define theta. If we really want theta to go from zero to two pi, it's a pain. How do you define the standard angle function from zero to two pi? You gotta think about this a little bit, right? Theta is equal to, there's cases to think about. It's inverse tangent of y over x. Provided that x and y are both zero, both positive, right? Because they're, I mean, and I guess we could have y equals to zero, right? Zero is okay. Zero is what gives us angle zero in zero to two pi, y equal to zero. Then what if we're in quadrant two? What's the formula then? Like what if I'm over here? Think two dimensionally here for a second, minus two, one. You know, that angle, what inverse tangent is giving you down here, right? Inverse tangent of uh, one over minus one is minus pi over four, but the real angle is over here. So we need pi plus inverse tangent of y over x, right? if x is less than zero and y is greater than or equal to zero. And, and in fact, is that, I think this formula continue, we can, it, it works the same over here, right? If I have a point like, say, minus one, minus one, we get what? Inverse tangent of one. So, So that's pi over four, right? So th this formula, it continues to work in quadrant two and also quadrant three. So we, we can erase this, just say for x less than zero, we can use that formula, right? That brings us to quadrant four. And what do we do there? I think we have to do, what do we do down here? Inverse tangent is part of it, right? How do we get, see this is supposed to give us values between three pi over two and two pi. How do we actually achieve that using inverse tangent as our formula? What's that? Oh, just do minus? But that will, um, but you know, inverse tangent always gives me outputs between plus and minus pi over two. This is going to be for x greater than zero and y less than zero. So we're going to be taking the inverse tangent of a negative number, which means we're going to be obtaining an angle between zero and minus pi over two. But we want the angle to be between three pi over two and two pi. Add two pi. You remember this in, in pre-calculus when we told you Standard angle is a piecewise defined function. These are the three cases. Oh, you actually saw this in pre-calculus? No, I haven't 
I mean, I, I never say this in pre-calculus. Like, I probably won't say this when I teach trigonometry next semester. What I do is I say, you guys, you learn to calculate the reference angle from looking at the little right triangle, and then you think through it. Geometrically, where's my angle, right? If you actually want to write down a stone cold formula for the standard angle that goes all the way around, it's a pain. It's always inverse tangent, if you like. And, but we sometimes add pi and sometimes add 2 pi, right? So I'm saying epsilon is equal to 0 pi or 2 pi for these different cases. But you see that um, you see that uh, you can differentiate this thing as long as you avoid where the cases glue together. When you differentiate it, you just differentiate inverse tangent of y over x, right? And the other piece is a constant, so it disappears. That's kind of okay, but there's an issue. So this is the formula for the chart. Now, is this continuous? I mean, just think about any point here, right? Any point on the XC plane. Approach it from this way versus approach it from the other side of the plane. Think about the difference. From the right side, theta goes to 0. 2 pi. Is that continuous? No, theta is not continuous there. There's a jump from 0 to 2 pi. I took an awful long time to explain it. But. Right, so that's a real problem that you can't get away from. And it's not just an artifact of spherical coordinates. It's actually something that's going to happen no matter what scheme you cook up to try to find patch, a patch on the sphere that goes over the whole sphere. No matter how you do it, it's always going to break down in this sense. It's not going to be continuous like you need for the whole thing. I have not proved that. I'm just telling you, you cannot find a patch on the whole sphere, which is a regular coordinate patch. How do I know that? There's a theorem that says that there does not exist a non-vanish, there does not exist a non-vanishing vector field on the sphere. Sometimes people call this the hairy ball theorem, like you can't comb the ball on a, you can't comb the hair on a ball in such a way that there's not somewhere a, uh, a part. There has to be some place where the hair, you have to imagine the hair lying flat on the head. It does not apply to your hair. But like imagine hair that, is, that has, has been pasted, you know, like is tangent to the head. And then you can think of the hair as being tangent vector fields to the surface. Not that I've defined what that means yet. We will eventually. Um, if you had a global coordinate patch on the sphere, you could look at like the partial velocity with respect to one of the parameters. All right, you can look at partial x, partial u. That gives you a vector field on the surface, which is everywhere non-zero. If the vector field, if one of the partial velocities, partial x or partial v, was zero, it would fail the it would fail the regularity condition. If either of the coordinate velocities drops to zero, you don't have rank two. So we defined a regular curve to mean that the velocity is non-zero on the whole thing. Regular surface is a continuation of that story. It's regular. And what that really means is that the surface is genuinely two-dimensional. If you have a drop in the rank of the Jacobian, that probably means that the mapping, the surface that you're looking at there is not really a surface. It's drop dimension. I'll give you an example in a second. But um, yeah, but anyway, this is, a, this is a somewhat deep theorem of topology, the Harry Ball theorem that you cannot find a non-vanishing vector field on a sphere. Uh, there has to be a point on the sphere where the vector field drops to zero. 
So uh, if you look at like. Well, that makes sense on a sphere, like there has to be a point. Right. So like. Right, so you might, you take the first glance at theta hat. Theta hat would seem to be non-vanishing on the whole sphere because it, like if you visualize theta hat on the sphere, you know, it's like, I can't draw it, but if I, if I could draw this, let me draw it top down. So theta hat, if this is if this is x and this is y, theta hat looks like this. I should, I should have used a different color. Oh well, right. And so theta hat's non-vanishing on the sphere, almost everywhere. But almost everywhere isn't everywhere. There are two points where theta hat. I would say you could look at it different ways. We could say theta hat zero at those points, or you could say it's not defined. The places where theta hat is not defined, right here. That's the z-axis. What's the angle of the z-axis in terms of theta? Like, you're not allowed to ask that question. That's right. You're not allowed to ask that question. What is theta on the z plus or minus z axis? <laughs> right. This is the same as asking the question in the plane in terms of polar coordinates. What's the angle of the origin? So for spherical coordinates, we're sort of stacking polar coordinates. So the z-axis becomes the origin in some sense for the theta when we extend it into three dimensions. You can think of it that way. But theta hat doesn't fit the bill. It's not a non-vanishing vector field on the sphere because of those two pesky points, the north and south pole of the sphere. So this is not an easy thing to prove that there doesn't exist a non-vanishing vector field that's a smooth non-vanishing vector field on the entirety of the sphere. It's called the Harry Ball Theorem. Now, let me give you the example of the surface, which isn't quite a surface. Um, by the way, if you want a sphere of radius r, what do you do? Same thing, but instead of saying rho equal to 1, put rho equal to r. Then we get a sphere of radius r, just the same, right? Another example, um, actually this is a theorem, g of x, y, z equal to a constant. So all x, y, z in R3 subject to this condition. In other words, you could say m equals to the inverse image under g of the set containing c. That's just a fancy way of saying the level set of g, right? This is a surface. Um, if the gradient of g um, is not equal to 0 on m. So this, this is the um, implicit function theorem applied in this context. To give you an example of this theorem, the sphere we just looked at, right? G of x, y, z, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to 1, right? What's the gradient of G? 2x, 
to y to z, right? And that's not equal to zero for x, y, z not equal to zero, 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 right? Can x, y, z be zero, zero, zero on the sphere? Yeah. Mm -mm. Right, x, y, z in, you know, g inverse of 1 has x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to 1, right? So they cannot all be 0. If they're all 0, that would give us 0 equals to 1, which is not allowed. So no, I mean, in other words, the origin is not on the sphere, right? Yeah. So that means that the level function for the sphere meets this, well, I would call it a regularity condition, which shows you by the implicit function theorem that it's a surface. The implicit function theorem says that if the gradient of G is non-zero, you can solve for one of the Cartesian variables as a function of the other remaining two. If the gradient's non-zero, that means at least one of the partial derivatives of G is non-zero. So we can solve for that. Um, eh. Let me not get into that too much, but let's see another example would be g of x, y, z equal to x squared plus y squared minus z squared, right? So that has gradient of g equal to what? 2x, 2y, minus 2z, right? And there we're going to get into trouble, right? If we set this equal to 0, With the, is 0 in here? The 0 satisfied x squared plus y squared minus z squared equal to 0? It does, right? So, yeah, I mean, gradient of g of 0, 0, 0 is equal to 0, 0, 0. So, therefore, this example does not meet the necessary condition to be a surface. Now that, that, that doesn't prove that it's not a surface, but we would worry that this might not be a surface. Let me give you a parameterization of this one. So, so here, if we, if we want to parameterize this thing, what we could do is we could do like x equal to um, z cosine theta, y equals to z sine theta, and um, z equal to z. Like that seems like it might be a good choice. So we'll do x of, I'll, I'll go back to u and v here. x of uv is, let's see here, u cosine, um, I'm going to use theta, theta is just easier u theta. So, and I'm going to use z. Why not? We can use z and theta. Um, goodness gracious. So z cosine theta, z sine theta. I'm, I'm using u in some sense. u is equal to z and, and v is equal to theta for the purpose of this example. Right? If you want to like compare it to what we did at start. So, seems safe enough. I mean, does that satisfy this equation? Whatever this thing is? Yeah, but you can get a zero, zero, zero. It can get a zero, zero. But, but we, the origin could be a point in the surface. That's not necessarily game over. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to say is x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared here, right? Do you guys agree? So I, I think it's, it, what I'm trying to say is if this is x 
and this is why it should be clear that x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared. So at least this parameterizes the level set which I've described over there. So I'm suspicious that if we look at the parameterization that I've come up with here, some part of our definition of regular coordinate patch is going to fall apart. So what's partial x partial z equal to? Very good. And what's partial x partial theta equal to? Zero, all right. And what is partial x partials, you know, what's the cross product of these? If that's, you know, everywhere non-zero, then we should be okay, right? Let me, let me point out something to you. This, what we're looking at is actually r hat plus z hat crossed with z theta hat. So if you, um, that, that's r hat plus z hat. And so fun fact, um, polar coordinates are a right-handed coordinate system. So if you know about this wild world of uh, fancy schmancy uh, hat vector stuff, r hat, theta hat, z hat, the um, cross product of these guys works according to the circle. So like r hat cross z hat is minus theta hat. Oh, excuse me, I'm just supposed to do r hat cross, good grief. Uh, so I've got z, r hat cross theta hat, plus z, z hat cross theta hat. I see here, so that's, of course you guys can calculate the cross product directly if you don't like my way, whatever. Um, r hat cross theta hat, that's z hat, so I got z, z hat. <laughs> that's just fun to say, z, z hat. And then the other one, z cross theta, that's, that's minus r, so minus um, z r hat. All right, fine, I'll put it back in the other, other notation. So what we're looking at here is minus z cosine theta, minus z sine theta, um, z. You're like, why don't you just use the determinant formula? I don't know, I just don't like to. Anyway, so there you go. And that's hunky-dory provided what? That's non-zero, except when what happens? When z equals to zero, we're in trouble. This patch is not regular when z equals to zero. Does this make sense? Well, the, the theorem let us down in that case too, right? If we could somehow just throw out from example two here, if we could just say, you know, we're going to throw out the point with z equal to zero, then we'd have gradient of g non-zero for such points, right? And for those kind of points, we could find a, we could write it as a surface. And this over here would be a perfectly reasonable patch for that surface if we could just throw out that one pesky point z equal to zero. Do you guys know why this is? What is, what is this example that we're toiling and working on here? So my question to you, what is geometrically x squared plus y squared equals to z squared? Do you know what it is? Three dimensions, right? So, pyramid. pyramid. Well, what I do when I'm tasked with figuring out what a surface is and I don't know what it is, I think about fixing one of the dimensions and seeing what happens in the other two. So, I think about freezing Z. 
Like what happens if I freeze z equals to z naught? I get x squared plus y squared equals to z naught squared, right? And I think you said that was a circle, right? That's a circle in the z equals z naught plane. It's a cone. That's what it is. See, because if I look at, if I freeze x equals to x naught, or let's say x equal to 0, right? Freeze x equal to 0, what's this? y squared equals to z squared, right? So that says z is equal to plus or minus y. So plus or minus y. And then this way it's a circle. But yeah, it's, it's a double cone. Aw, oh, man. We're at a chalkboard. Um, and what's, what's going on here? That point right there, right? That's that point, zero, zero, zero. And that's exactly the point where we drop in dimension from two dimensions down to one. It's not an accident that the patch fails there. Because it's not a surface there, it's one dimensional. Anywhere else, if you zoom in, right, you could kind of imagine just taking a little piece of graph paper and kind of just laying it over that, right? It's two-dimensional. You can't lay a piece of graph paper without getting it all crunkled <laughs> at that point. It's called a singularity, a singular point. Oh, it's not a problem. It's just not a, I mean, a cone is a perfectly well-defined object. Yeah. It's just not a surface, according to our definition. It just takes one bad apple to spoil the bunch, you know? That one point ruins it. Now, I'm claiming much, something much stronger. I'm claiming that no matter how you attempt to build patches on that level set, you cannot overcome this difficulty we just faced with our construction. There is no way you can find a one-to-one -one continuous bijection onto a set containing the origin. The fact that it pinches down to a point there, it will ruin any attempt that you make to make a continuous bijection between that point and R2. And that's what really is at the heart here, is that the surface is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the plane in a, in a continuous fashion. This is not. But it's okay. I mean, it is, that's an equation. You can look at the level set. It is a cone. It's a well-defined thing. You know, we can say lots of things about it. It's just not a surface. In fact, we have a definition for this sort of thing. Um, if you have a manifold, or in this case, a surface, with a discrete, like, you know, if they're separated, um, set of singularities, this is called an orbifold. So an orbifold is a manifold, usually, except a couple points here and there, which have, like, a cusp corner, something like that. Physicists actually apply these things, um, modern physics, Something like, at least when I was in grad school, people were playing games with taking orbifolds that describe the geometry of space-time or whatever, and then wherever the cusps were, they were building into the shape of the corners symmetry groups, which encode physics. So like, orbifolds have been studied a lot in the last couple decades because of their possible application to string theory and model building. That is not part of this course. Um, <laughs> I really shouldn't even be talking about orbifolds at all in here, but I think it's a natural, I mean, we, it's just something that happens, right? Because we do study cones in Calculus 3, right? And the definition of surface is rather restrictive, actually. But that's okay, because we want to be able to prove theorems without facing these kinds of pathological issues.
right? It kind of comes back to that. And like in Calculus 3, we do stuff with that patch, which is not a regular patch, right? But why doesn't it hurt us? Because in Calculus 3, what we're doing is we're doing integrals, right? We're integrating over things. And where, where, that, where that failure from continuity happens, it's not really an issue because the integral is insensitive. Like if you do an integral over a, over a surface, if you do something, if you do something finite but discontinuous, if you make like a jump at one point or even along a curve, it's not going to alter the integral. In three dimensions, you can mess up a like a surface of points with a, some sort of finite jump discontinuity. It's not going to you having that kind of discontinuity. The, the integral can can handle it. It doesn't. It's not troublesome. Um, as long as we're not talking about like an infinite. <coughs> Of course, infinities we have to deal with like improper integration, like that. That you got to be wary of that, um, and that does matter to applications, like I showed you the other day with the Coulomb field. You know, where the where the where the where the vector field not defined at the origin can be the entire story of the game. I mean, that can be mission critical, but um, it just so happens the things we do in calculus three, the fact that cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates aren't honest to goodness coordinate systems in the sense we rigorously define in here, it doesn't hurt us. But listen, I'm going to stop here for today. I think I owe you guys about another hour, but um, I think this is a pretty good place to stop. Like past here, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Past this, for, well, first of all, I want to give you another like half dozen examples, which will take me forever to write on the board, but I can show you on a piece of paper really quick. All right, so we have like surfaces of rotation. There's all kinds of really, really cool surfaces to look at. So I'll show you those. Then the other thing we do is define how to um, calculate tangent vectors on a surface, how to build differential forms on a surface, um, and how to do like how to define a, a mapping from one surface to another. And there, the most interesting thing is we talk about when is one surface and another surface what's called diffeomorphic. So that will be a function that goes from one surface to another, which is a bijection, but it's also smooth. So we'll, we'll define what we mean by a smooth function from one surface to the other. It's going to be defined in terms of these coordinate maps, right? Um, so anyway, I'm going to try to cover up through section 4.5 when I talk for another hour to you guys. And you don't need to watch that video before your test. That can wait until like, oh, curses. I see the problem with that. <laughs> Dang it. This once a week schedule. Pox upon it. Um, I will not make a video because it's stupid. Well, dang it. I'm going to try to make a video with the examples in it because that I can't do on the board worth anything in here. But the construction stuff I'll save for after the test next time, like how to, the differential, like, I will try to make a video that if you don't watch the video, it will not make it so you can't understand what we're going to do after you take the test next week. All right, so like, you can watch it at, at some point.